Welcome to the Nutrition Information Session at the Center for Medical and Surgical Weight Loss with Middlesex Health Surgical Alliance. I'm Kitty Spedding, Registered Dietitian and Certified Specialist in Obesity Weight Management. And I'm Mary Burbank, Registered Dietitian. The purpose of the pre-op nutrition evaluation is to assess your readiness and action for behavior change, help you reach your pre-op goal weight, provide instruction on the post-op diet stages, provide instruction on the maintenance diet and maintenance lifestyle to help you reach your goals and maintain your post-op weight loss. We are here to support you. We are not the food police. Our patients are typically well-versed in dieting and have tried several diets over many years in attempts to achieve weight loss. You come with a vast knowledge and already know what foods we should be eating more of and less of in the day. We hope you can take advantage of the time prior to surgery to delve in and understand your relationship with food. Try and figure out what signals you to start eating, stop eating, and if you have any triggers for overeating. Most people to some degree emotionally eat. Our life experiences have unfortunately caused many of us to ignore our natural ability to only eat when we're truly hungry and stop eating when full. Figuring out your triggers to eat prior to surgery can help you have a more successful weight loss journey following surgery. Weight loss surgery is not a guarantee for easy long-term weight loss and maintenance. It is an amazing tool that allows you to reach your weight loss goals and if used properly, can provide long-term weight loss and maintenance. What can you expect? So that initial visit with a dietitian typically lasts about an hour. We're gonna take a look at your dieting history, your food logs. We're gonna establish that pre-op go weight if it hasn't already been established with a surgeon. We'll set you up with a meal plan to help you reach your pre-op go weight. We'll discuss behaviors for success after surgery. We might discuss a little bit about the bypass and the sleeve nutrition. And just remember that we as the dietitians are here to support you in your weight loss journey. We want you to achieve your goals of having weight loss surgery and have the weight loss results you deserve. Every time you come and meet with a dietitian, please bring food logs with you. And it's important to find what works the best for you. So there are many different applications you can use. You're welcome to use a free app such as MyFitnessPal or Berrytastic. You can use the paper food logs we provide from the office. You can even use a fun notebook or a food journal or even create your own Excel sheet. Really the key piece here is finding what works for you because we know most people do not like to record food logs. I think that's kind of just known in the office, but they do have a lot of good benefits. So research shows that just the act of recording what we're going to eat or what we have eaten can make us more mindful of what we eat and causes us to change our behaviors. For some people, just logging their food intake can cause weight loss. Also remember that your food logs are your way of showing us how hard you've been working on behavior change. Food logs have also been shown to help people maintain weight loss long-term when kept daily. This is an example of a food log. And what I want you to take from this is how detailed it is. So a, de a food log should be detailed enough that we would be able to replicate that meal. So instead of just saying I had toast for breakfast, I'd like to know how many slices of toast, what kind of bread was it, what did you put on there? What did you drink with it? How many ounces and what did you put in there? And just be honest with those food logs. Remember every little bite that we put in our mouth does really count. And it's helpful for us to, to get a good idea of what your typical habits are and your typical food consumption. This will help guide us in that initial appointment to set you up with a meal plan that you feel good about and you feel that you can follow successfully. So here we have these behaviors for success, which I sometimes call a little quirky because they are a little different than what you've maybe been asked to do in the past. These behaviors though have been established to help you ease that transition after surgery so you feel good and help promote long-term success. The first one I want you to work on is eliminating drinks with caffeine, added sugar, and carbonation. So the caffeine needs to be gone about a month before surgery and for three months after surgery. You are able to do decaf coffee, that's fine with us. And just remember this is a short-term goal here. It's not forever that you have to get rid of that coffee. But also thinking about those sources of added sugar that we oftentimes don't even know is there. For example, if you were to order a medium frozen coffee mocha swirl with cream from Dunkin Donuts, it has a whopping 850 calories, 
122 grams of sugar and over a half a cup of sugar is what that equals. And no one, when they're drinking their morning cup of coffee or their morning frozen coffee, would think that they're consuming almost more than a half day's worth of calories in one drink. We also need to get rid of the carbonation, and that can be found in your sodas, whether that's regular or diet, as well as your seltzer waters. But we do want you to be well hydrated, so drinking six to eight cups of calorie-free fluids between meals only. So calorie-free fluids, obviously water, we know that's one of the best hydrators. You can also do crystal light, vitamin water zero, fruit 2O, you can do little meal squirts, you could do fruit infusions, all of those are fine to do. And then the other key piece is we want you to separate your solid foods from your liquids. So the goal is to stop drinking 30 minutes before a meal, not drink anything with the meal, and then wait 30 minutes after the meal to begin drinking again. And we ask you to do that because after surgery, if you put those two things together, it's gonna cause a lot of nausea and lead to vomiting. Your stomach after surgery is very small, so we wanna go slow. We also want you to chew your food really well. So the next time you sit down and eat, just count how many times you chew that bite of food before swallowing. The goal is to get to 20 to 30 chews before you swallow the food. And that allows us to decrease discomfort and vomiting after surgery. That pouch or stomach after the surgery is very small. And if you give it this big glob of food that's very hard, and the decreased stomach acid, especially with the gastric bypass, can make it difficult for your body to tolerate it. I want you to have three meals and one snack a day. So there's lots of different guidelines out there on how many meals and snacks we should be having in a day. I'm sure you've tried them all through all the different diets that are out there, from intermittent fasting to even the six small meals a day. But what we find works best specific for bariatric surgery is the three meals, one, maybe two snacks in the day. I want you to be more active as possible. So you're gonna increase your physical activity wherever you are comfortable doing so. So if you sit most of the day, maybe set a timer on your phone to stand up every hour to, and get up and walk around the house. Or if you know you really could tolerate a 30 minute walk, then try to go out and get some exercise in. Take a multivitamin every day. At this point in time, it does not matter what brand it is, just a generic over-the-counter women's one a day or a men's one a day would be sufficient and eliminate alcoholic beverages. So we do need to be off of those for a month before surgery and for six months after surgery. We just wanna make sure that the relationship with alcohol is not any greater than we think it is, and it's pretty easy to eliminate that before surgery. So after that initial appointment with a dietitian, you're gonna come back and see us about a month later. It's gonna last about 30 minutes for that follow-up appointment. We're gonna take a look at those food logs, so please make sure to bring those with you to the appointment. We're gonna see how are we doing on practicing those behavior changes? Have you reached your pre-op goal weight? And are you showing a good faith effort in making recommended behavior changes for long-term success? We are not expecting perfection. We just wanna see that motivation and desire to make some changes. Now in that first appointment, if we see you're doing a great job, great, we can move on towards surgery. If there are some things that are concerning or maybe we still need to work on a little uh, bit more, then we'll have you come back and see us again. One thing we'll also help you to determine in your first appointment is how many visits with the dietitian do you need to attend? This depends on two main factors. The first factor is your insurance. Your insurance is gonna determine how many visits with a dietitian they require to cover the surgery. The second is you. It's really important for us during that time to assess your motivation and success with positive behavior modifications during the initial dietary visit. We're going to help you set some goals that will help you get to a point where surgery is a safe and appropriate option for you. And if you're achieving those goals, we will be happy to clear you for surgery. If after some time you're still struggling, that's okay. Many people struggle during this process. If that's the case, we'll discuss what your challenges are and set new goals to help you get that clearance. Our main goal over this time is to assess and assist you with your readiness for surgery and make surgery a safe option for you. Let's discuss post-op diet stages. After surgery, there are five diet stages that are intended to assist you in transitioning to the final maintenance diet. This is important to make sure that we are safely transitioning you to solid foods. Following these stages is the best way to achieve your weight loss goals. So the first stage after surgery is going to be the water stage. This stage typically occurs the first day after surgery, and during this time, you're going to aim to drink one fluid ounce of water over one hour. This is one of those things that Kitty was talking about that can be a little bit quirky after surgery. Again, during this time, you're still in the hospital. It's that first day after surgery, and you're only drinking water. 
We wanna make sure that you're drinking about a medicine cup volume of water over one hour. If you've seen a medicine cup on the top of a, a medicine bottle, you know what that looks like. And most people kind of laugh because they think it's not gonna take me that long to drink that. But the day after surgery, it's really hard to start drinking fluids again. So you're gonna be sipping that for quite a while over that hour of time. It's important to not use any straws. You're just sipping at that time. If you're successful with that stage, by the second day, you'll be cleared to move on to stage two, which is our clear liquid diet stage. This happens about the second day after surgery and we're aiming for now three fluid ounces or a total of three medicine cups over one hour of time. The allowed items included in a clear liquid diet are things like water, crystal light, decaf tea with a no calorie sweetener, broth or sugar-free jello. This is typically going to be stuff that's provided to you by the hospital, although there may be some things that are approved that you could bring yourself, but usually we're having these provided by the hospital. And again, you wanna make sure that you're recording all of your fluid intake during this time and limiting to three fluid ounces or three medicine cups over one hour. You're really just helping your stomach to practice processing fluids again. We'll make sure in the hospital that you are getting appropriately hydrated um, through other methods other than just your, your by mouth intake. On the third day, you're typically going to be moved on to stage three, which is our high protein full liquid diet stage. This is the stage that most people have heard a lot about because they've talked to people who've had the surgery and they've heard about the different protein shakes and things like that that they will be on. So this typically starts the day that you're discharged from the hospital. You're going to follow this diet stage for two weeks in time, and during this stage, you're replacing your meals with high-protein liquid drinks. So I have a couple of examples here. Um, something like a Premier Protein drink would be a good example of something that we would use as a high-protein beverage, and this is going to act as your meal replacement during that time. Um, our goal during this time is typically two to three protein shakes a day to meet your protein needs. Other items that you'll have as full liquids are our light Greek yogurt, low-fat cream soups, skim or 1% milk, or you could also do something like uh, sugar-free pudding. It's important to notice that right now we're just transitioning, right? So this isn't a forever, <laughs> this isn't a forever meal plan. This is something we're just following for two weeks until we go back for our post-op appointment to see if we can transition to some of those mechanical soft or soft mushy protein foods. The other really important thing about this stage is we're gonna start taking our post-op supplements. So our bariatric specific multivitamins are gonna be necessary to start during this time in order to meet all of our nutrient needs. These are going to be our multivitamin, B12, iron, vitamin D, and thiamine. We're not starting calcium until stage five. So if we tolerate stage three, our high protein full liquids, by the time we come in for our post-op appointment, you're going to be transitioned onto stage four, which is our pureed or soft mushy protein foods. So again, this is typically started two to three weeks after surgery, and we follow this for another two weeks. And this is when we're transitioning over to solid, solid food. So we're going from a liquid to something that's semi-liquid, but semi-solid. And some of the items that people use with um, ease to tr do that transition during this time is things like canned tuna or chicken, soft baked fish like tilapia or salmon, pureed or shredded berry mashed chicken, or things like turkey and other poultry products, eggs, low fat cheeses, low-fat cottage cheese or low-fat ricotta cheese. You're also responsible for getting about 48 to 64 ounces of low calorie or no calorie ideally fluids. And these are all of your fluids from the clear liquid stage. You're gonna focus on decaf, no calorie, no carbonation. Um, and again, we're just transitioning to attempt to meet your needs for protein and fluids until we can get you on that solid food diet. Typically, people are doing this by having three meals and one snack a day of about two ounces of that softer mushy protein. So it's really not a large volume at this time. This is gonna be a time period where you're seeing a lot of adjustment to digesting your foods, but also a lot of weight loss. If you do well on that, when you come in to see the dietitian for your first post-op appointment, we will likely transition you to the stage five diet, which is our soft, food, our soft foods transitioning to solid foods and our maintenance diet. So this is, again, started four to six weeks after surgery, and this is eventually maintained for life. 
So one thing we hear a lot of people talk about, and you'll hear this in support groups and throughout this process, is that the diet, the surgery is a tool for weight loss for long-term weight maintenance as well. And this is all because of these maintenance behaviors that we're going to help you transition to in this maintenance diet. So the maintenance diet is gonna consist of protein at every meal and snack. At every meal and snack, you should be aiming for a lean protein. You're gonna to aim to consume that protein in two to three ounce portions with all of your meals, and usually about one ounce with a snack. And you're gonna to aim to have six ounces of protein about for the whole day and two servings of dairy daily, which will usually let you get to about 60 to 70 grams of protein a day. Slowly over the period of many months, we are going to begin to reintroduce other foods. So it's not just about protein. You will not be on a protein only diet forever. During this time, we are slowly reintroducing those fibrous foods. So those are things that would be somewhat uncomfortable to digest right after surgery. We don't want you doing those right away. Right away, so you're going to do things like vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, which we will have you slowly introduce. It's really important to not kind of follow a protein only diet long term. We need that fiber and those whole grains to meet other nutrient needs. And that's a common misconception with many people that you should never have carbohydrates again. So we're going to help you learn how to do that. And the other thing, like I mentioned back when we were talking about the, the multivitamins, is starting a calcium supplement. Stage five is the time to start 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams of a calcium citrate supplement plus vitamin D. So we're going to make sure you're meeting all your calcium needs so your bones can stay healthy and strong. So on this maintenance diet, you're having about three balanced meals and one nutrition snack daily. It's always going to start with your protein and eventually should include a protein, a non-starchy vegetable, and a little bit of whole grain. At six months, most patients, I have some medicine cups here so we can show a demonstration. At six months post-op, most patients are tolerating about a half a cup of solid food. By one year post-op, most patients are doing a whole cup of solid food. And at the very, very most, people are doing a cup and a half of solid food by about 18 months to two years post-op. But some people don't get to this this volume. So we'll teach you how within this volume to meet your needs with protein, non-starchy vegetables, whole grains, and a healthy fat choice. It's also important to make sure that you're getting eight cups or about 48 to 64 ounces of those calorie-free fluids, which as Kitty mentioned, you have to have them in between meals only. And by one year post-op, you can drink right up to a meal, but you want to wait at least an hour to two hours after a meal to drink. And no maintenance weight loss program is complete without regular exercise. So while the surgery is a tool, it is not a diet program that's going to help you avoid having to ever exercise again. Regular exercise is a part of every healthy lifestyle, and we're going to mostly be the ones who talk to you about what your exercise plans are and what types of exercise you enjoy. So let's talk about some sample meals. It's always helpful to review samples of meals to help people get an idea of what things they might be eating at one year post-op. <clears throat> so a sample breakfast, if we were considering breakfast, um, would be half a cup of oatmeal, that's our whole grain, with Splenda if you like it sweetened. So those oatmeal packets you get at the store might not be the best option after surgery. They can be very high in sugar. We can also add half a cup of blueberries to get some healthy fiber and also add some sweetness to that. And then one hard boiled egg would be our protein source. So we're always looking for the protein when we have a meal. A sample lunch on the maintenance diet would be half of a whole wheat sandwich, so that's a sandwich made with one slice of bread, two ounces of turkey, one teaspoon mayo, lettuce, and tomato. And then on the side, this person is having half a cup of cut up raw vegetables. So raw vegetables are not something that you're gonna tolerate right away, but we do want you to get to a point where you can have them again. And that's honestly the thing that most people tell us they miss the most when we're transitioning them to that stage five diet is having something like a crunchy vegetable or a salad. A sample dinner, and I have a kind of a good plate here, um, would be two to three ounces of grilled salmon. This portion is about three ounces, so this might be a little bit larger. I hope you can all see this. Um, half a cup of grilled asparagus or another non-starchy vegetable like broccoli or carrots um, or these green beans. And then I didn't have a sample of rice, so let's imagine that this is rice, but half a cup of brown rice on the side. Um, and then 
we could add a healthy fat to this by cooking one of our vegetables in a small portion of olive oil or using uh, a little tiny bit of butter, but we wanna make sure that we're using fats in moderation to limit our calories. <clears throat> now, a good strategy after surgery is to use a modified plate. Um, this is actually from my own kitchen. This is the salad plate that goes with my dish set, and this is gonna be a really good way to limit your portions if you're not somebody who wants to pull out the measuring cup every day. Using a smaller dish is the best way to help maintain your portion control. And no day is complete for most people without um, an additional snack. Um, sometimes people can get their protein needs in without having that extra snack, but if you're somebody who has very low volume tolerance, you're likely gonna rely on one high protein snack during the day. And then that's really gonna help to meet your energy needs, especially if you're somebody who's doing a lot of exercise after surgery, and also to meet your protein needs. And that would usually look something like one small apple with a teaspoon of peanut, I'm sorry, a tablespoon of peanut butter. So the peanut butter is your protein or three to four whole grain crackers with one ounce of low fat cheese. So that cheese is gonna be our protein. And remember it should be a low fat variety or cut up veggie sticks with one tablespoon of hummus. So those are just some samples of meals and snacks. So potential problems after surgery. Whether you've had the gastric bypass or the sleeve, we can have nausea and vomiting, constipation, stomach bloating and flatulence, diarrhea, dehydration, hair loss, and vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So for nausea and vomiting, most often that's gonna be caused by behaviors that you're doing. So either we're drinking too fast, eating too fast, trying to eat too much food in one sitting, eating and drinking at the same time, or not chewing your food well enough. So if you're finding you are nauseous, feeling like you need to vomit after the surgery, take a step back and assess how am I eating my foods, am I going too fast, and see if you can moderate those behaviors to reduce those feelings. Constipation is extremely common after the surgery. If you haven't noticed, immediately after from surgery, we've kind of taken away anything that would give you a lot of roughage. So we've removed the whole grains, we've removed those fruits and vegetables from the diet. So if you are having any issues, just let us know in the office and we can give you some tips for relief. Stomach bloating and flatulence is pretty common immediately following the surgery, and for some patients, a little bit, a couple months following surgery as well, too. So that's why we don't want you to be drinking any beverages with bubbles in them, because that can be bothersome and hurt and add to the issue. When we start to reintroduce our cooked vegetables after the surgery, I don't recommend jumping in with broccoli or cauliflower or Brussels sprouts, something that's really cruciferous. They can be extra gas forming, maybe starting out with a cooked green bean or cooked carrots can be a little bit gentler on the GI tract. Diarrhea, so some patients can have issues with lactose intolerance after the surgery. So if you're having any issues there, it's a little bit more common with our gastric bypass. You'd wanna switch over to like a lactate milk. We would wanna watch out for dehydration. So this is where you wanna get in the habit of having that water bottle with you wherever you go. So you're sipping on that fluid throughout the day, making sure to separate it by 30 minutes before and after those meals. So it can be challenging. Your stomach is very small after surgery, so you really have to think about it all day long to be drinking those fluids. Also know that sometimes, so some patients love water prior to surgery. They try to drink their water after surgery and it just doesn't taste right. It might sit heavy in the stomach. It might taste metallic-y to them. So you need to experience Experiment. So maybe you find you can only drink herbal teas after surgery. Maybe you find it has to be ice cold to drink it. Maybe it needs a little bit of crystal light or a little meal squirt in there so it has a little bit of a flavor. Or maybe you find it has to be only warm liquids to go down. So you need to kind of play around with it and experiment. Hair loss, which is otherwise known as telogen effluvian as the medical term, is really your body's major reaction to surgery. If it's going to occur, it typically starts about three months after surgery and will be done by about six months after surgery. Most people worry about what this hair loss is going to look like. I can never tell when a patient comes into the office. It's very slight. It's just something you're going to notice while you're brushing your hair or maybe in the shower. But it is most likely not related to protein intake and it is most likely not a vitamin or mineral deficiencies. If we're seeing significant hair loss long term out from surgery, say we're 18 months out from surgery, then we'd want you to come in the office and we'd want to make sure to do some lab work to just assess um, we don't have anything else going on. And vitamin and mineral deficiency. So as Mary mentioned, we want you to be on a bariatric specific multivitamin after surgery. The surgery itself can increase your risk of a lot of nutrient deficiencies from B12, vitamin D, calcium. We can have issues with iron stores. So those bariatric vitamins are pretty important and you want to make sure to take them every day. 
those who are non-compliant with their vitamins, we absolutely find that they do have deficiencies after the surgery. So potential problems specific to the gastric bypass is dumping syndrome and temporary lactose intolerance, which I actually discussed previously on the first slide. Dumping syndrome, though, is typically caused from consuming foods that are rich in sugar and fat and presents in many patients after surgery in varying degrees. Typically, you're getting the shakes, the sweats, and you're running to the bathroom with diarrhea. It's not pleasant whatsoever. Any patient you've heard who's experienced this say they never want to experience it again. And the most classic food to cause dumping syndrome is ice cream because it's got lots of sugar and lots of fat in it. And some people say to themselves, this sounds awesome. Sign me up. I love ice cream. I need to have a negative consequence to eating that ice cream. But I'll just let you know, dumping syndrome only happens in about 50% of patients after the surgery. And I also find that the further out from surgery you go, the decreased reaction you're gonna get. So let's say for some reason you wanna test the waters a month out from surgery, which I don't recommend, but you have a bite of ice cream and it gives the dumping syndrome. And then say a year out from surgery, you try it again, now it's a quarter of a cup that you can tolerate before you have that dumping episode. And then five years out from surgery, it might be a cup before it gives you that negative reaction. And if we've had the sleeve gastrectomy, you're at an increased risk for acid reflux. So if you have severe acid reflux or GERD prior to surgery, that would be a contraindication to having the surgery. And that's a discussion you're going to have with the surgeon prior to surgery, of course. And then you do have a decreased risk of the dumping syndrome, although it is not impossible to have a dumping syndrome-like episodes after the sleeve gastrectomy. I will say fried foods tend to be the worst food that is tall or the food that causes the most intolerances with the sleeve after the surgery. Then following up after the surgery, for the dietitians, you're gonna see us four weeks out from surgery, six months out from surgery, a year out from surgery, and every year thereafter. But we're really here to support you, if you haven't heard that enough throughout this video, is if you wanna come and see us more often, we are here to support you, we're here to help you, so just call the office and make an appointment. And just make sure when you come in to see us, you're bringing those food logs with you. So just a couple reminders for the end here. So make sure you, um, well, not make sure you've already had your visit with Dr. Aaron now, most likely. You've got that initial visit with the surgeon done. Once you have that initial visit with the surgeon, then you'll be getting an appointment with the dietitian. Make sure to check your insurance coverage for bariatric surgery and also to find out what is the requirement for supervised weight loss exercise um, counseling visits prior to surgery. It can range from no requirements up to six months. You want to attend or watch online if we were doing all virtual um, our support groups. You need to go to two support groups. You need to attend the first month, the pre-op nutrition and psychological information session. The support groups occur on the third, fourth, and fifth Mondays of every month at 630. You need to do the nutrition evaluation, the psychological evaluation, and any other testing that's been ordered by your surgeon. And we do ask to make sure to get that lab work done pretty early in the process. There may be certain labs that could be abnormal and need to be addressed prior to the surgery. We understand this is a very long list and we understand once you make the choice to have bariatric surgery, you wanna have it tomorrow because it's a big decision to make. But we just ask that you be patient with the process. We know there's lots of steps to do, but we will get you there. And thank you for listening in. Please make sure to complete the online questionnaire through my chart to show your attendance, and we look forward to seeing you in the office.